Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, mammals. This video is getting posted on Monday, April the 27th, and it's going to start the last of our new material, which is a short unit on ecology. It's quite possible that by Tuesday or Wednesday, I'll go ahead and have all the assignments for the rest of the year shared out to you so you guys can spend your time getting things completed and I can spend my time getting caught up on grading and answering your questions. That way everything is squared away with enough time before the end of the year and we're not doing anything trying to get it in under the wire. So just letting you know that's coming. Back to today's video and the topic is going to be the carbon cycle. Some vocab that I'm going to be using that shows up in the Google Forms that's attached to this is the difference between a pool versus a flux and a pool's residence time. So I'm going to be using those terms and you can listen in for them so that you get the questions right on the Google Forms that I've shared with this. This is a carbon cycle. It has lots of boxes and arrows on it. The boxes represent pools, places where carbon atoms can actually be. And the arrows represent fluxes, which are processes that would move carbon atoms from one pool to another. So some of the pools that we can have, carbon atoms can be in the atmosphere in the form of carbon dioxide. Carbon atoms can be in animal and plant biomass. You saw when you were doing your macromolecule presentation that all of these macromolecules have carbon in them as a major component. And then when these plants and animals die, they can be buried and enter some different kinds of storages. So I'll go briefly through these different processes or fluxes that move carbon atoms between the pools. So starting in the atmosphere, carbon atoms exist as carbon dioxide. And the only way to get them out of the atmosphere for practical purposes is to have it photosynthesized by plants and incorporated into the carbohydrate molecules that plants make when they combine carbon dioxide with water as part of photosynthesis. That's where we get the name carbohydrate because it's adding water to carbon dioxide to make these carbohydrates. So that's the process that can remove carbon out of the atmosphere and get it into plants. Then, of course, the plants can die and go into decomposition, or they can be eaten by animals, which animals can die and send it to decomposition too, but they might also use those carbon atoms for energy source through respiration, and we send it back to the atmosphere through respiration. So once the carbon atom gets into an animal, we've got two fluxes out of it, respiration or death and decomposition. Once it decomposes, most things just decomposing lying out on the surface of the ground are going to be broken down by microbes, essentially respired by microbes, and sent right back into carbon dioxide. However, there's a chance that some of this decomposition um, material could end up being buried where it can enter into some longer term forms of storage, such as soil organic matter, the stuff that makes our soil kind of rich and brown, Carbonifer carboniferous rocks like limestone. If you looked at a lot of the limestone around here, you see lots and lots of fossils in it, and that's because it's made of um, ancient oceanic plants and animals that got buried instead of simply decomposing and returning back to CO2. And so now that carbon that was part of their uh, exoskeletons for marine life, their shells, ends up in our limestone. Or it could be buried in conditions that turn it into coal or oil. These processes have what we call a very long residence time. And that's because it's not that there's a lot of fluxes that gets it in there. It's really a special case for something to be buried and end up in one of these things. 
as I said before, the vast majority of it ends up in CO2 and returning back to the atmosphere. The key thing that makes these processes down here at the bottom have long residence times, or these pools have long residence times, is they have very little flux out. Because naturally, the only way for things to leave rocks and fossil fuels is some geologic processes like earthquakes or volcanoes that are going to bring those rocks back up to the surface. And that just doesn't happen very much. The vast majority of our carbon here on Earth is in these forms, rocks and fossil fuel. So that's where most of it is. Only a tiny, tiny amount is actually in the atmosphere, like 0.04% of the gas in the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. And the reason not a lot of it accumulates here is this has a very short residence time because there's lots of flux out. You might look at this and say, all oh, there's all these fluxes going in, but it's not so much how many processes send it there, but how much. And the flux out to plants is very, very large. I want to show one more slide here, which adds humans into the mix of this. Okay. Most of our fluxes are, are the same. All the fluxes that were there naturally are still there. It's just that I've added humans. And don't get me wrong here, I'm not hating on humans. I'm a human. I like being a human. And we need resources. Um, so I'm not like, you know, preaching that everything that humans do is bad. It's just important for us to be mindful uh, because that's kind of the unique thing about being a human is that we can really think about our actions and how they affect things. And what we mainly change about this is we start pulling flux out of these long-term pools. When we alter the land and disturb the soil, that increases the amount of soil organic matter that decays. We use carboniferous rocks as building materials, and also it's an important component in a lot of industrial processes used as a raw material, principally limestone. And, of course, the big one is we like to burn dinosaurs for energy. So our major change here is we are increasing the flux out of all of these long-term pools and that flux ends up primarily ending back up as CO2. Some of our material will go into plastic waste, which not really existing in nature. Microbes don't know how to decompose it. And so plastic, uh, once it's formed, also has a very, very long residence time. Um, it just basically gets buried. And some people are even identifying a new form of rock called plastiglomerate where plastic material gets buried and incorporated into new rocks. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. But that's the main way that we affect it is we're shifting the balance between the long-term residence pools and the atmospheric uh, CO2 because we're taking things that once they end up in these pools have very low fluxes out, and we're adding a flux out of that. So I'm going to end up there. Uh, there's a Google form that's posted on this today, um, and then tomorrow we're going to actually do a dice game with this where you will start in one of these pools and you will roll dice to determine how you move through the pool. And I've kind of weighted the the numbers that get you to leave and go into a certain pool to reflect the residence time. So we'll collect data as a class into a, a Google Sheet for everyone and look and see if we end up realistically with these kinds of pools having very, very short residence times versus these pools having long residence times. And we'll play it once with humans and once without humans and see if that makes a difference. But I'll post another video tomorrow with some more specific instructions on how to do that. But for now, as always, take care of yourself and others, practice good hygiene, and I'll see you on the flip side.